Welcome to the Valley Advocate Podcast, featuring interviews that take us deeper into the people and happenings on the local scene. For more podcasts and a closer look at what's going on in the Valley, visit us at valleyadvocate.com. Hi, this is Dave Eisenstatter. I am the editor of The Valley Advocate. This is The Valley Advocate podcast that we do with Amherst Media. I'm here with Gina Beavers, yes. arts and culture editor. Yes, you are. And we're here with Kathy Harrison, who is a local author from Cummington, Massachusetts. And she's the author of Prepping 101. If I had my glasses, I could read that. 40 steps you can take to be prepared for what? <laughs> yeah. For whatever. I was looking at your Valley Advocate, and you were talking about the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and the good <laughs> news happens. is that if you're prepared for the zombie apocalypse, you're also prepared for your basic power outage. Mm. Awesome. Now, if you're prepared for your basic Basic power outage. You're not necessarily prepared for the zombie apocalypse. This so is true. We need to figure <laughs> this, this is things true. out. So, so yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So you're not talking about the grand apocalypse of, of of whatever. You're talking about anything. So many things that are happening now: natural disasters, uh, grid failures, things like that. You're talking about the everyday that could happen tomorrow. I am, and even the more personal things. You lose your job. You have a house fire. Oh. All of these things are your personal apocalypse. Mm. Oh, so these okay. are yeah yeah these are these are steps you can take to be prepared for that kind of a thing too. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So this is you, this isn't your first book. It is not. It's actually my fifth book. Goodness. Yes, I wrote a book on costume design for kids, and I think I sold about twenty copies. My mother <laughs> bought nineteen of them, uh, but it's all good. It was fun. And right. then I wrote two books about foster care and adoption mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, and then I wrote Just in Case, which was my first um, prepping book: how to be prepared for the how to be self sufficient when the unexpected happens. It's a good thing to know the title of your own book, uh, <laughs> and it it was a wonderful book and it has sold very well but this is a little easier for people who like step by step mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this gives you more of a step by step yeah your intro act and we should just like hold this up hold, for people who can up, see up. from the camera it's but a um book. <laughs> but like it is. it is uh you know you say in your intro that you never met a list you didn't like right so this is like a really a way to be a really organized yeah. about being prepared yes i like to be organized and uh this gave me an opportunity to do something that was uh, sequential. Mm. It's always fun. So was there something that happened to you or th that, that put you on this road to preparedness or is it something that just that is just something Good that question. came So I live in the hill towns, mm -hmm. and right away that puts you in the place where when the power goes out, it's our power. Yeah. Uh, winter storms happen, right. and for many years we lived at the Bryan Homestead, um, which is way off in the hinterlands yeah, of Cummington. And um, one year I had a new baby, and he got really sick in the middle of a terrible ice storm. And we managed to get through the night. It was clear in the morning that we needed to get to a hospital. And we couldn't get out. The road was blocked. Oh. So my husband was out with chainsaws. He was doing the whole Paul Bunyan thing. And he got a tractor. And he pulled the trees out of the road. And we slipped down. And it occurred to me he had a gastrointestinal thing and spent mm. the next week in you know, PDICU oh, my goodness. that all I really needed was some uh, rehydration mixture, which is easy it's you can get it in a powder it lasts just about forever and i didn't have that simple thing that was ridiculous mm. i should have had that on hand i have it on hand now right. i can tell you uh shortly after that well, i say shortly several years we had gone to a, a race my husband is a triathlete and we'd gone to a race in um schenectady new york and woke up the morning of the race and we were just under a foot and a half of heavy wet awful snow so we knew the race was off, packed up. We were with three other couples and packed up our cars, headed home, got the New York Thruway, and we couldn't. We were there for seven hours. Now, seven mm. hours is not a really long time. People have been stuck on roads for days. That's a long time. But it feels like a long time. <laughs> and we were really lucky. We weren't prepared right. because we were smart. We were only prepared because we thought we were going to a picnic. Right. So we had blankets and we had wine and we had good food. It was kind of, we <laughs> had a don't really drink good and number, drive. number one. No, on the list. no, no, no. Well, I was, my husband was. <laughs> but, uh, but we've had events like that. Yeah. And we lived through. Uh, ice storms where people around us were without power for weeks, where we were handing out water, where we were had people come to our house because they needed a shower. And in fact, I 
one of my sons, he and his wife had just had a baby, and they lived in East Hampton, and they couldn't stay in their home. Right. Had they not had us to come to, they'd have been in a shelter, mm. which is really my whole point of telling people be prepared is you want to avoid shelters. I consider this our civic duty that if you're capable of being prepared for an emergency, you're one less person that emergency services has to look out for and take care of mm -hmm. and feed and make sure that you're warm or you have medical care. It's our responsibility um, as adults. What do you find that people are kind of the least prepared for? Or, or, or what, do you, what do you find that people, is something that's simple that they can do that they would be a lot more prepared for a lot of things? Most people have no idea where their water comes from and what to do if it doesn't come out of the faucet when they turn. Yeah. Now, if you have a well, mm -hmm. you're in big trouble if the power goes out unless mm -hmm. you have a hand pump, which is not a horribly expensive thing to do. Uh, and Bruce and I have a, have a water filter. We have a lot of surface water, but almost no surface water in this country is um, potable almost can't drink and you should just assume if it's on the surface that you cannot drink it mm. right that's right nice. so a water filter you can make one that is good for filtering out big stuff but if you want to make sure you're not sick you need a good water filter to me that seems like a reasonable place to put a couple of hundred dollars mm -hmm. yeah water is super important and absolutely have to yeah have. and something that could potentially as you're pointing out just not be as stable as you think it is. Absolutely. So how would you express that need or that urgency to say, like say, if, if, I, if I live in Cummington, I totally can get what you're saying. If I'm living yes. in the heart of Springfield or the heart of Hartford, how, how would you impress upon me that it's important to have this kind of thing? Because it, it is a source of, everything is a source of convenience in the city. Even if, if it's not that convenient, it's so much more convenient. You don't have to take it seriously if you are absolutely, positively convinced that nothing awful is ever going to happen <laughs> that will take down the grid for several weeks or have a supply disruption that is major. Uh, if you're convinced that there will always be plenty of energy. But I you have to have a real sense of imagination for that in some ways because hmm. so, only I'm only saying that because so many people haven't lived through. Mm -hmm. I remember, I remember the energy crisis in the 70s with people sitting in I lines and stuff like that, yes. right? Remember? Oh, absolutely. So it's kind of Every other day, you it, could get four exactly. gallons. Exactly. So, yeah. But so many people have never experienced that kind of shortage, that kind of, mm. of, of kind, you know, that it, there's just not enough. We and live with even I don't understand <laughs> that there's not enough so, beyond a certain point. So what you have is something called a normalcy bias. Mm. Because <laughs> something has been normal for you forever. It is yeah. impossible for you to look ahead and say, what is normal for me now was actually not normal less than 100 years ago. Right. It is not normal for most of the rest of the world. To most of the rest of the world, we are the 1%. You, me, you. Right. Um, but that normalcy bias puts us in a bind because then when we're slapped with reality, um, for instance, let me give you a scenario that's very likely. The CDC mm -hmm. anticipates a pandemic, mm. a global outbreak of disease. They do not say if it happens, they say when it happens. And it is unreasonable to look at our world with people just jetting here, there, and everywhere, and back mm -hmm. and forth, and planes and airports teeming with people from all over the planet and hacking and coughing to assume that that's never going to happen because it has not happened in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. If, however, you were alive in 1918. 18 with the Spanish influenza. Right? Absolutely. Right. Then that killed more people than the war oh, itself. the war, right. Absolutely. So uh, that one thing, suppose it took out, and I don't mean killed, suppose it just made 40% of the population too sick to go to work. Who do you think fills those grocery shelves? Mm. Who do you think uh, checks your groceries out? Who picks the crops? Who cans the food? Those 40% <laughs> and those are the people who are not available and all of a sudden normal is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be prepared for the abnormal. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, we were talking before and one of the things that you were saying that you won't find in your book is um, how to stock up on the latest weaponry and guns and fill yeah. your bunker <laughs> with uh, uh, things that will uh, mow down your neighbors as they yeah. try to as they try to get your stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. 
Can you talk about kind of your your view? Like you were talking before about uh, kind of a community based future, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. So, I think that what we're probably looking at the best case scenario for the United States is that we look at contraction which means you just get a little smaller, you get a little more local, your food comes from a little closer. And I think in the scenario, I actually don't expect the zombies to come. I don't think I have to shoot anybody. You'll be surprised. If, <laughs> I guess I will be. Normal <laughs> bias, that normal? Goes that, again. Yeah. Um, I think in this scenario, how am I best served? I am best served if my neighbors are my friends, mm -hmm. if they are my extended family. I'm not food secure if my neighbors aren't eating. I actually don't want to kill my next door neighbor over a jar of applesauce. To mm. me, that seems like not the life I want to plan. So what I would prefer to do is to say, gee, you know, your lot abuts our lot. We're actually doing this right now. And we have enough space in our land to put in a couple of pigs. So we put in three pigs. And we have two other neighbors. And we'll, they buy food for us. You know, we share the work and mm -hmm. we share the, and we'll share the pork. I have another neighbor who had a good chicken coop. I didn't have a chicken coop, but I wanted chickens. It makes perfect sense. We have chickens with our neighbor. Mm -hmm. We buy the food. He does the work. He wants to go away. We can take care of the chickens for a few days. So in this way, we have an interconnectedness that I think is helpful. And if the grid went down, the first thing I would do is call all of my neighbors over, and I'd serve a lovely big soup. And they'd say, let's talk about how we're going to address this. What are we going to do to make sure that we're taking care of each other? Um, I belong to the CERT team in Cummington. It's the Community Emergency Response Team. And what we're doing right now is compiling a list of those people in our community who are disabled or um, very old, people who are alone, so that we can check on those people mm -hmm. if there's an emergency. I, I don't want to ignore them. This is my extended family. so. How, how do we get there? How do we, I mean, how do we get, you know, better acquainted with our neighbors? You have to knock on the door. And we are really taught to be, to respect people's privacy. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to intrude on people. I think you knock on the door and you bring a loaf of bread or you bring a jar yeah. of jelly. And then they tell you they're gluten sensitive and you say, oh, I'm so sorry. But at any face, <laughs> but you make that, you make right. that connection. You make an offering, a goodwill offering. And if so, we have a lot of raspberries. I just invite neighbors to come. I have a swimming pool. I will send out a blanket email and say, hey, the pool's open. Come on over. It's 90 degrees. I want people to feel like my home is connected to them and like I'm part of their family too. Yeah. Uh, and looking at the places within a community that you can make other connections. We've let our institutions fall by the wayside. It's very hard to get people to want to join the Lions Club or the, the Masons or the Order of the Moose or all the animal mm -hmm. orders. <laughs> and it's hard to get people who want to do community service in terms of joining a fire, volunteer fire department or serving on a planning board. I think you have to step up and do those things. Yeah. That's how you own your community. You know, there was the Occupy movement several years ago. Yes. Um, our community statement is Blockupy. We can't occupy <laughs> Wall Street, but we can occupy the block we live on. Oh. And so we Blockupy. Uh, we, we use our common spaces. We go to the park and we have big picnics and we hold dances down there. It's a way to connect with our neighbors. And we all have something to share. We all have something sure. to offer. Even someone who may look like they don't may have knowledge or information or stories. They could be a wealth of information that you actually use and need. I think that's interesting what you're advocating this you're kind of advocating a pre-social contraction as yes. opposed to what what theoretically will happen yes um but also it's in direct um opposition to this globalization that absolutely we're on the road to every day where things are absolutely. dispersed so immensely mm -hmm. but the but then the, there's that you know by local these campaigns that are mm -hmm. happening where people are doing this kind of contraction it's kind of it's it's interesting so you're advocate you're advocating do it before you have to do it before you have to and uh, one of the places that we are the most vulnerable so you're talking about city folks yeah. is to a very fragile just-in-time delivery system mm. 
it is said that we have three days worth of food on the shelf in a grocery store. That's actually only true if there's not a run in the grocery store. If there's a run in the grocery store, you probably have three hours. Wow. And the it's last true. hour, you're not going to get much except, I don't know, a can of hairspray That's or very, something. You can see that before every storm. <coughs> every the, single and, storm, and the, I don't during understand During the tornado it. in Springfield, Absolutely. I remember. Absolutely. That delivery system out. is so fragile. Hmm. You have to have a computer system that works. If the computer goes down, you're you don't get anything. Right. You have to have reliable fuel. Well, if the sods or the Iranians decide that they're just not happy with us, they can shut that off. It can be something uh, during Katrina. One of the issues in the Gulf is that that took out all those right. refineries and yes. the sure. price of oil oh, oh spiked gosh, yeah. way up. And so we're, we are certainly at risk and vulnerable there, but people who are living uh, more on the fringes, people mm -hmm. who are really poor, they are really at risk. It's one thing for me to say, right. yeah, I'm going to suck it up and pay $7 a gallon. Sure. I'm going to go to the market. But if you're living on almost no money, yeah. that is not an option you have. So having some food put back is a really good idea. It can be just the little thing that gets you over that hump mm -hmm. or learning how to grow anything on your plate and you don't need much space sure if you've got a patio you can have some container plants a lot of what we eat we actually landscape with mm -hmm. i make sure that we landscape with edibles you well, know see them is beautiful but it's also very edible mm -hmm. and you had you had said before that uh you sometimes encounter these uh, bunker folks, I do. and mm. and you've been, and you've been called. <clears throat> excuse me, you've been called naive in the past. Pollyanna. Yes. Okay. Does well, this have anything all to do with Nat Geo? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that that was so eye opening for me. So I was asked if I do the Nat Geo Doomsday Prepper after my first book came out. What, what is that? So I'm oh, ignorant my goodness. of this. So. Okay. So when Just In Case came out, there was a series on the National Geographic <clears throat> show called Doomsday Preppers. And really? they asked if I would, would participate. <laughs> okay. I, oh, I said yes. You didn't and know. <laughs> I didn't know. I had never seen it. Yeah. I didn't know what I was getting it's into. Crazy. It was crazy. And what they really wanted was to make people who prepare look look nuts. In fact, afterwards, after the fact, they didn't like me very much because I wouldn't do any of the things they asked me to do. I wasn't going to act like I was nuts. Right. Mm. Um, after the fact, several of us who had participated got together and had a little email group, and they had set those people up to look right. nuts. Huh. And we were better prepared for that because I had done a lot of TV with other books. I knew how this worked. And what I knew was that I didn't have to say yes. Right. And so they'd say, so we'd like you to do this. Uh, my husband's a beekeeper. And they wanted us to put on our bee suits and act like oh, the bees had God. gotten into them and that we were hitting ourselves. And I said, well, that would be stupid. The <laughs> reason for the suit, <laughs> is, bees in the suit. <laughs> is so that you don't get bees oh, in the suit. You don't get bees in the suit. The and no, I'm not, I'm not too. going to do that. That's ridiculous. And he said, well, you know, this is what you signed up for. And I said, oh, I beg your pardon. Show me in the contract where I said I had to lie or act stupid. And if yeah. I sign something, I'm your girl. But I didn't, and I didn't. So, in fact, he called a few months later and said, we're doing a reunion show uh, for people who've done it before. We'd like to, you know, take a look at people, see if they're still doing this. And I said, yeah, no, thank you. Mm. And I think they probably called five times. And then the fifth time, I said, you're, you're just not used to people telling you no, are you? Mm. And they really were not used to hearing no. Sure. People assume there's a camera here. Right. Oh, I have to do what they tell me. No, you don't. Anyway, the interesting part for me is that there was a Facebook, or not a face, a website for, for the show, and people wrote in comments. And fully half of the comments were about how, because we didn't have guns, people were going to, uh, you know, come and steal my applesauce. And one gentleman said, I don't even bother storing food. I've got, you know, this, this, and this gun. And I said, so that's your survival plan, is that you're going to kill people and steal your thing? Your yeah. mother must be really proud. Mm. That's, yeah. yeah, I don't know what to say to people like this. Yeah. I just right. don't get it. The reality is... You know, my husband and I and a bunch of kids, really, are we going to get into a firefight with, mm -hmm. you know, Mad Max? No, that's not what, that, I don't anticipate that happening. I yeah. sure hope not. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, so, wait, as you were doing kind of research for, for this book, 
were there a lot of surprises along the way about um, kind of what you know products that you tested out or um, other um, other things for being prepared? There were there were some surprises. I I bought a um, a plastic liner that's supposed to go in your bathtub. You know the websites will always say fill your bathtub at the first sign of a storm. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've never had a bathtub that didn't leak ever in my <laughs> entire life, right. ever. So I got this, you know, I bought this thing to try out, and it fills your bathtub. You fill it with water, and it's a lot of water. It's a lovely thing, but it's single-use plastic. That is just oh. not reasonable to me. It was yeah. expensive. There are many, many easier ways to put away that kind of water. Water's cheap. It's heavy, and it's awkward. Uh, it's bulky. But it's inexpensive. Anybody can put away, you know, three or four days supply of water with no investment at all. Without like a, a <clears throat> bathtub sized piece of plastic that you just have to throw Absolutely, away. Absolutely, that you then it. throw away. So there was that piece. Uh, I'm a little concerned often about recommending more stuff. We are, mm. we are a yeah. world that's kind of overwhelmed with stuff and there's a lot of stuff here. Um, so I'm really looking for those things, not that you buy once and pack away in a closet and never look at, but I'm, I'm looking more at the sorts of things that you do anyway. Uh, everybody should have a first aid kit. That just makes sense, right? Make it a little bigger than you might think. Make it a little juicier. Make sure you've got enough, not just for you, but for your next door neighbor. And you don't need to buy a first aid kit. You can create one with a tackle box and a trip to CVS. It's, you don't need to be buying so much stuff. Um, but I did try a lot of stuff, and there were a few things that I did find remarkably useful. I have a pocket juice, which is an awesome little gizmo that you keep plugged into your wall. And when you take it off, you can charge your cell phone seven times. Wow. Well, that's a really useful thing. It when is. you live out in the hills the way mm -hmm. I do, if I get stuck on the side of the road, and you know, I look and oh my goodness, my cell phone's not charged. That's a yep. horrible feeling. I can use my pocket juice and charge my cell phone and call my husband and let him know I'm running late. Uh, so some things are really good to have and some things are sort of no brainers. Duct tape, oh my goodness, like store a lot of duct tape. Mm. It fixes so many things. Um, here's something a lot of people don't think about. So one of the first things I recommend is that everybody have a preparedness notebook. And in my notebook, I keep the originals of all of my important papers, birth certificates, adoption decrees, copies of all of our immunizations. If you've got pets um, for my cat, I keep the, the shot record. In the back, I have a flash drive. On that flash drive are my pictures. Mm. So if, perchance, my house burned down, I grab first my children, then I grab the notebook mm -hmm. because also in there are copies of things like my insurance agent's number and my social security card and, and all of our medical cards, all of our insurance. These things are critical. If you have to rebuild your life, there you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't cost you any money. Yeah. In the bureaucratic <coughs> world that we live right. in, it's like those yeah. are the things that can really Absolutely. Put up Don't blocks. you want to know what your credit card number is mm -hmm. if the whole house is gone, including your wallet with your credit card in it? Having that number makes your life so much easier because what's the first thing you hear when you call is, and what's your number? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No idea. Right. So before we went on, uh, the advocate did <laughs> its own little apocalypse survival guide, uh, which we wanted it's to. It's so cool! We, I love we, this. I so how do we do? How do we know? So you we, actually we, did really well okay. in, with the zombies. <laughs> well, I we like did talk having about zombies. <laughs> I like having the zombies included because, as I said, if you're prepared for zombies, Ready. you're prepared for everything. Um, and here's the best thing about it: you have to laugh at some of this, but the whole time you're laughing because it's very well written. You're also thinking, huh, I hadn't, hadn't actually thought about that. It's true. And, and getting people to not think about this in terms of, I'm so scared. You don't need to be scared. You just need to be reasonable. You need to be organized. And you need to be thoughtful about what the future might hold. And honestly, sitting here right now in this moment, I don't know what next week holds. Mm -hmm. This is probably the most um, unsettled I felt in my entire adult life mm. in terms of 
what's coming. Climate change, we used to talk about, you know, as though it was something that would happen in the future. The numbers thrown around was 2,100. Right. Uh-uh, mm -hmm. here, now, today, in this country, we're looking at the reality of mm -hmm. climate change. And we don't know what that's going to look like, but we can pretty much guess that it is not going to be pretty. Right. Uh, we don't know what our food supply is going to look like. There is a wheat rust, I believe it's called UG99, that has the potential to decimate our, our wheat crop. We did a few really foolish things um, historically, and one of the most foolish is that we took all the diversity out of what we grow. Mm -hmm. So there are only a few kinds of rice, and there are there's one main for, so you're really vulnerable yeah. if there's a virus. You can lose an entire crop of mm -hmm. something critical, oats or wheat or corn. That was probably not the smartest thing we ever did. Historically, there were hundreds of varieties of wheat. Sure. And if one was vulnerable to drought, well, gee, this other variety wasn't. People right. still ate. Um, and the other really foolish thing we did <clears throat> was let our food turn into um, property of corporations. Thank you, Monsanto. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so they own the seed, and they own, and farmers have to pay for yep. that seed. And so historically, they kept their seed. They saved their seed, and they could regrow themselves. They were self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And that is just not the case right now. So we're really vulnerable right. if, when you're counting on corporations to feed you. If they feed you, they own you. And one of the, um, one of the statements you'll hear a lot in this community is that we are nine meals from anarchy. And that's actually true. Hmm. Most yeah, of us can manage for probably three days. Yeah. You've probably got enough stuff in your house. Um, but you are nine meals from things not being, not being fun. Boy. All right. Well, where do, where can people get your book? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I know um, I need to get one. So if you don't, if you um, have a local bookstore that's an independent, please ask them to order oh, yeah. it for yes. you. That's your best you bet. That. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. You can get it on Amazon. Any place that's pretty mainstream. Great. Yeah. Well, well I got a lot to think about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And water to get. And water to get. <laughs> yeah. Right. And a big burky <laughs> water filter. We've both, we've got a big to do list. Yeah. A big yeah. to do yeah. list. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so much You're for coming. You're very in. welcome. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to visit us at valleyadvocate.com.